My Smart Tech TV. Today I'm joined by Sarah Fired, who's the Smart Cities and Urban Transformation Lead at AECOM. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Great to be here. And, and especially as it's IWD week, it's International Women's Day week. Um, the actual day was on Tuesday, but um, celebrations take place all throughout the week. So I'm really excited to be interviewing you, particularly on this on this week of all weeks. Now, Sarah, I guess to start off with, tell us a little bit about your story and how you got into the wonderful world of smart cities. Thanks, Jess. It's really incredible to be here today um, and join with you with the conversation. I guess it's such a topical, um, uh, you know, sort of conversation that we're having at the moment and particularly as a male dominated industry as you would know with the technology it's really um, exciting to be talking about this in this sort of moment in time so really for me I've always been incredibly interested in cities um, my background is in urban design um, and you know in their complexity being dynamic and constantly changing and often they're really unpredictable um, so as city shapers, we tend to make decisions to inform future planning based on the knowledge or past experience of, of responding to these challenges within the various systems in cities. So what I mean by systems is like transport, water, built environment, and infrastructure, and so forth. But today, cities are becoming increasingly denser and more complex, um, especially with, you know, as you know, with the global crisis, the pandemic to climate change, we've really sort of exposed the vulnerability of these um, building blocks and the foundations of cities. Um, so uh, instead of coping with these fluxes um, that exist or these different um, patterns that exist within cities, uh, whether it was in terms of the urban built environment or the natural environment. So I started questioning a lot of things in terms of, um, you know, how do we predict these crises? How do we better manage our assets in cities to mitigate this impact? How do city governments uh, know where to prioritize, especially with this limited funding that they have at the moment? Where do they invest next? How do we prioritize it? So while I was taking my master's at Harvard, um, this really was the first time I started exploring and delving into these questions and finding ways um, that we can really use data and technology to sort of inform decisions um, in cities to help mitigate some of these challenges. Amazing. Um, you mentioned there that you um, you did your master's at Harvard. I know that you're also, you also wear the hat of being the content creator and writer for the Cities and Digital Executives course at Harvard, BPL office. Can you talk me through your experience with this? Um, and I suppose why courses like this are important for people working in the industry? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I guess working at Acom as a smart cities lead is very, very exciting because it's really about, you know, putting um, ideas to action and really how do we plan for infrastructure and so forth. Um, the involvement with Harvard is very much about, you know, how to, we're designing an executive course. That's um, primarily my um, sort of role there. And the course goes through, um, you know, the different tools that you can use in order for you to address challenges in cities from a lens of an urban designer, from a lens of looking at the challenge before you look at the technology, because really technology and data and urban analytics is very much about a tool to use to inform or use to address a challenge. But for us, we're really looking at how can urban designers or the lens of designers use our agency or even as anyone else within sort of the smart cities realm or digital cities realm can use their agency to really, um, for the benefit of working within this discipline, how can they contribute and add a different lens to how we can address those challenges in cities. So if you're a social worker, if you're an activist, if you're a planner, an urban designer, an engineer, um, a technologist, any of those different um, disciplines, how can you use your agency in order for you to really uh, bring a different lens to understand, as I said, these challenges in cities? When you talk about those challenges in cities, what are some of the, um, I suppose, uh, key trends and challenges that you're seeing at the moment, particularly in a post-pandemic world? I'm so glad you asked this question, Jess. I think this is one of the most critical things that we have at the moment is so there's so many challenges, and especially with COVID, you know, it's really exposed the vulnerability of our systems in, in cities. Um, you know, things, you know, the inequality, for example, that always kind of existed and bubbled underneath the surface, but in a lot of cities around the world that became at the forefront. So how can we, now we started asking questions, how can we, instead of, you know, addressing a challenge in a city, say, you know, um, let's manage waste better. Is it really the most critical thing or is it about um, how can we enable connectivity for people that don't have access to 
as, as simple as you know the digital or you know Wi-Fi or any of these sort of tools. So we know where to prioritize these sort of investments. Um, I guess more broadly speaking, um, as I said, it's more about the vulnerability of our social infrastructure that we've seen, whether it was around education, health, housing, um, and transportation, while sort of exacerbating um, our most you know, pressing urban issues like inequality, as I mentioned, and climate change. Um, but I think with the pandemic, we really do have the unique opportunity to rethink the design of our cities and respond to these societal changes and challenges. Um, if you look more um, centered around New South Wales, it's something that's super exciting is this New South Wales government started publishing um, guidelines about how we can better think about smart places. And they really put the focus on the people. Um, and that was such an amazing document to read and they've really outlined it well. Um, and then they put the principles and how you can think that and gave the tools to the people to be able to start using that agency from whatever discipline. So that was super exciting to see. And they've, uh, then they followed with dedicating a whole fund to help these projects start catalyzing in our cities. Um, on a more human scale, for example, we started questioning some of the fundamental things from the day-to-day -day activities. What needs, so for example, the presence of, um, you know, the physical space. Do we need to be physically in a, a specific place to perform a specific activity? So what do I mean by that? Do we need to be in the office? Uh, do we need to be face-to-face um, -face shopping or do we need to meet do we need to travel to a specific place in order to conduct some sort of meeting? Um, then you had tools like um, VR to kind of help bring that additional dimension of movement. But really, it's about, um, you know, allowed us to kind of question these things. We do need the physical space. And I think, as we were talking before, it's critical and cannot be replaced. And I think it's great what you said there around, um, you know, putting the people first. It's, uh, it absolutely makes sense to do that. And I suppose one of the ways that you would do that would be via data collection and then using that data to make yes. more informed decisions. Can you give me some examples of how data can make a real impact to people living in a city? Totally. I think if you think about data, there's passive and active. Let's, let's categorize them and, you know, sort of, in very random categories, but in a way that passive um, uh, collection of data is really by using IoT sensors in cities. So you understand people's movements, you understand patterns of behavior, you're able to make decisions, put them back onto the platform. Let's say this is sorry, this is a more um, passive yeah, um, um, uh, form of data collection. The more active form of collection is really when you do surveys, when you do the social media, you use it to kind of inform these decisions. So that's, um, that's, um, that's kind of the two different ways. And you kind of need them because sometimes you can't really get the character of um, uh, the full uh, image of the cultural value or the cultural elements behind um, the way a city is designed. When we're talking about passive uh, data, I know that I read online that you worked on a project with the city of Melbourne and micro labs around uh, store shop fronts. Can you talk to me about that project? Because it's really interesting. Yeah, um, it's a really, I'm really glad you asked that question because it really pins it down to some real projects um, that we're, we're undertaking. So this is a project that we're running with the city of Melbourne and we've partnered with them to sort of to really address one particular challenge is after the consecutive lockdowns that we've had in 2020, the city of Melbourne had in 2020, um, there's resulted in so many businesses sort of going out of, um, you know, closing down or shutting down. So over um, 50,000 jobs um, were being lost and about 13.2% completely wiped out, which is quite dramatic. And if you think about small businesses, there's 2,000 businesses have, you know, completely shut and there was, you know, too many start signs going for lease instead of, you know, active shop fronts. So and that really impacted the vibe of the city. So one of the solutions that we decided on is how can we reactivate these places by using, um, by you know, creating digitally enabled spaces and redefine the paradigm of shop fronts of what their purpose is to connect the community with, you know, exactly with their needs um, and include those that have been really impacted. So one of the, um, so what we did is that we're using sensors, one to help us understand, we're, we're using different, I guess, uh, modifications of the plan, of the floor plan. And we're using it because we have so many partners and innovators and entrepreneurs that are connected to this space and they're going to be occupying this space. We really wanna make sure that we understand what's their needs and what's working and what's not when we're thinking about a floor plan for a particular shop front. So what we're doing there is we're using passive data or IoT sensors to really understand how these people are moving around the spaces with a particular floor layout. 
and how and then comparing it over time with the different layouts is it then we you know look at the uses was it because of the uses was it because of a particular change in the floor plan that really informed the different activity um and that's that's really how we're using it um so interesting because also if you i mean you're doing it in a passive way it's you really get a good understanding of it asking people what they did they probably forget like it's sometimes hard when you're really? doing a survey to actually give honest advice whereas actually tracking that is, is such a good way to get that data totally and i think what you can add a layer which is about more the active layer is really by asking them how did they feel about the space did it help them did it um you know um address what they needed did it address their challenges did they find it enjoyable did they connect with the people these are the kind of things that we get from this active participation but we can't get it through passive data so there's benefits to both it's incredible and you mentioned that's obviously one of the um projects that you've worked on what are some of the other projects that you're working on that are really exciting you at the moment yeah, I guess NEOM is one of my, my most exciting projects. Um, it's a 100, we're working on a particular sort of section, which is the line. Um, it's the smartest city in the world, um, and it's an urban development that goes, it's a linear sort of line city uh, with zero cars and everything accessible within a five minute uh, walk. So if you think about, it's 174 kilometers. So think about all the different challenges that you're going to get by achieving that. We haven't worked with anything in that scale I personally haven't worked in anything as exciting and in that scale ever, but you're looking at flying cars, you're looking at autonomous vehicles, you're looking at all of the different, let's say in the sci-fi world, what could be actually implemented. So um, it goes all the way from touching on the basic foundational needs, which is ensuring safety for the pedestrians and the users of the space, all the way to ensuring connectivity and to um, connectivity, whether it was through our traditional modes of walking or flying cars. So it's it's a very exciting project. So and how far away do you think flying um, cars are? <laughs> um, I think they're closer than what we think. How successful, I'm not sure. I can't tell you yet. <laughs> Both exciting and terrifying at the same time. Yeah, well, <laughs> but the exciting thing is you can do it in a top-down approach to smart city planning, which yeah. is from, you know, let's rebuild something brand new, mm. a new city. Cool. And I know I, I many years ago went to a conference, the guy called um, Nolan Bushnell was presenting. He invented Pac-Man. He's like a tech guy from Silicon Valley. And he was saying that uh, within the next 10 years, all cars would be moving underground and in running yes. tunnel systems. And there was going to be, you know, free up all this space for urban design. And um, and I mean, you're kind of starting to see, you know, I know Elon Musk put in an application in Miami for uh, underground tunnels. And he's starting to see these things happening. Yes. So it's quite exciting. Um, exactly. Yeah. For cities, it will be super interesting to see their transformation. Very, very interesting. And that leads, I guess, to my next question. What excites you the most about the industry? It's such an, a, an amazing industry, but what um, what do you love about it? So many things. <laughs> where, do I, where do I even start? I guess I love, my passion has always been about using data to, you know, tackle a problem or inform decisions in cities. Um, you know, I think smart cities, in a way, they really build or bridge the imagination to reality um, in some ways. And they're really bridging sort of collaboration between two industries, the smart, the city shapers, urban designers, you know, landscape architects, architects, all of these engineers and so forth with the technology um, aspect. So a lot of things now we probably don't need to build them. We can just, you know, um, connect them through, not through hard infrastructure, we can connect them through soft infrastructure. IOTs and, and so forth, or underground hidden cables. So um, I think this is what excites me is that we're really putting two industries together and seeing what happens. I'm excited about the prospect that we're going to be able to finally quantify the problems that we have. So we're no longer saying, you know, probably parking our biases to a certain extent mm -hmm. and seeing where's the pressing needs that we need in order for us to address the true problems that we have in cities, whether it was, as I said, equality or inequality in cities and and so forth yeah definitely you've got the you've got the hard evidence from the data and that makes it a lot more easy to solve those challenges yeah. as well. i know that so, you you've traveled and lived in lots of different um cities when it comes to smart cities how does australia fare compared to other places around the world <laughs> depends where you're comparing it to yeah. so we're comparing it to um a few cities out there i mean let's say dubai uh, you know saudi arabia let's just yeah. say that um, where it seems like we're a little bit behind okay. <laughs> the budgets that we have. Yeah. 
a little bit more limited. I know Israel's as well, pretty head. Israel, and then you also have, um, you know, the United States and the UK, their transportation and their investment in smart sort of infrastructure around there is, is phenomenal. So we're getting there. Our approach is just a little bit different. We want to see where we've done it before, before we can put it back into our cities, which is good and bad at the same time. That's great. It was an exciting space. I guess my last questions are kind of bringing it back to uh, it being International Women's Day week. What would your advice be to anyone wanting to get into the industry, but particularly to women? I guess don't be afraid of your agency. Be bold and really go out there and see how your agency can really contribute to these conversations because you never know. It's not really just about one particular discipline now. It's really about all the different disciplines coming in and saying, having a say into a ch- into the challenges. Technology is a tool. Let's work with it. Don't be afraid to explore it um, and understand it. And so is data. Um, it's, you know, they, they're just tools to help you um, with whatever agency you're working with. Um, and yeah. Thank you. I could literally talk to you all day. You're so passionate and there's so much amazing stuff happening. For anyone listening who wants to find out more on the work that you're doing, um, where, where should they go? Please go on my LinkedIn. There's also on the ACOM website. We've got plenty of resources there. We've just recently published Digital Cities Volume 2, which talks about the role of digital in um, uh, in human-centric design. Um, I, I really recommend that. And you can see a full list of people, either myself or others, that have um, co-authored that volume. We'll link that in the show notes as well. Thank you again, Thank and you. happy International Women's Day week. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate your time. Likewise, Jessica, have a great one.